Cool. Good evening. Um, it's good to be here in Paris. Thanks to Algolia for having me. Um, we've been working together for the past year and it's been great hanging out at their, their office today. Um, so yeah, I'm Theo Foley. I'm a product manager at Depop. This is my uh, Depop profile. Um, we, uh, we all dog food the app and make sure we're using it to understand the problems that our, our users face. Um, so what I wanted to talk to everyone uh, to you about tonight is the challenges that we face in scaling our mobile team. Um, we've grown quite rapidly, so I think there's some interesting things that might be relevant to our iOS focused audience. Um, so show of hands, does anyone know of Depop? Have, has anyone used Depop? Okay, so hardly anyone in the room. Good. Um, so. Depop is a social mobile first marketplace. Um, our mission is to empower people to bring creativity to the world and we're empowering a generation of creatives to break the mold, break out of the nine to five corporate world and um, basically build their own brands from their bedroom. Um, and we have tons of young people on the app and old people on the app who are making use of their creative passions and selling items on the app. Um, there's a focus of Depop around community um, and ease of use and social was really built into the platform from day one. So these are some of the core uh, sections of the app. Um, you, you, you list an item and those items live on your profile. They're things that you're going to sell. People can like your items, they can save your items, comment on them, chat to you openly via messages. And then as you follow people, you start to see their items in your feed. Um, you have an explore section where you can search, you can see curated content by Depop, um, and you can easily list things that you want to sell. Um, something that makes Depop stand out from uh, other, other marketplace out there is really our community. We uh, have a very creative community of uh, fashion bloggers, designers, artists, musicians, um, and that kind of creativity was built into the DNA of Depop from um, day one because our founder, um, had previously run a magazine called Pig from Milan who focused on identifying up and coming musicians and designers. Um, and that was run for 10 years before he set up Super Sunglasses that revolutionized the, the sunglasses uh, market. Um, and lots of celebrities picked up on their sunglasses and helped them grow. And then in 2011, we got to uh, the creation of Depop. And these are some of the early sketches on the left. And anyone that's into their electro music may notice Busy P, uh, Pedro Winter, who was one of Simon's friends who helped in the early pitch decks. Um, and that was it, that was the beginning of Depop, um, social marketplace. And fast forward a number of years, 2018, we're still here, we're still going. We are now over 100 employees, um, mainly focused in London, but we also have spaces in LA, in New York um, and Milan. Um, and we've had over 11 million downloads so far. So this was the engineering team, top right in 2013. Marco, our back-end engineer, and Nabil, our first iOS engineer. Um, and the iOS engineering team pretty much stayed one or two people for a number of years until last year in 2017, we had big investment into our engineering team. We went from around 20 engineers to 50 engineers and our iOS team grew from one developer to, to seven developers. Um, and you know, that comes with expectations that you're gonna be able to deliver a lot more changes to the app. And without any scalable processes to help us do that, what we saw was a lot of change going on, but also we're releasing and introducing a lot more crashes. So our crash rate was going up, introducing a lot more bugs. And we were scared of releasing and you should be celebrating your releases. You shouldn't be fearful of your releases. And release process was chaotic. There was no regular cadence. Um, and it, yeah, not a great environment to be in and not making use of that, you know, investment that we've got. So our ability to test and learn and to add value to our users uh, and add value to the business wasn't, wasn't uh, where it needed to be. So what are some of the things that the team focused on? Um, now, some of this might be textbook to, to you guys, but these are the things that have helped us to improve. Um, architecture was a focus our release process and automation. So 
On architecture, there wasn't really any agreed structure to the code. It had all been in Nabil's head. He was the only guy working on the app. Um, and then we had seven engineers all of a sudden writing lots of code, lots of, lots of stories, lots of Jira tickets. Um, and the team had to agree on a, a, a common standard architecture. And guys have gone for the Viper architecture, um, meaning that the code is a lot more structured. As a, as a product manager, I'm aware that I need to write solid acceptance criteria that can be used um, for, by the developers to create a more robust app that we can then build on faster in the future. And this, you know, this type of change, often you can get met with resistance from some product managers when you want to refactor code because there's lots of old legacy code that needs to come into this architecture. But it's just understanding between the development team and the product team that this is something that helps us to going back to that, that diagram of you know, build, measure, learn. We can go through that cycle quicker if we invest up front by getting a, a, a structured arch, uh, a, an architecture in place that allows us to do that in future. Um, so that was one aspect of the things that we changed. Um, another aspect is around our release process. And um, in the past, we didn't really have a re uh, much of a release process. We wanted to release every two weeks, but there was no regular cadence. Um, as we scaled and we had a lot more change going on, um, you find that you know, teams are close to, close to the, re the target release date, but not quite there. Product managers might be shouting, like shouting, throwing their toys out the pram because they want to get their thing out there earlier in this release rather than just wait in another two weeks. Um, and what, some of the changes that we made to improve our release process. So previously, we, just have, we were putting untested code into a branch that was then having the release candidate cut from. And inside that, we were sometimes had untested code that hadn't been signed off by the testers. So we now have uh, specific test builds. When a, ticket, uh, when a ticket's ready for a test, uh, a prototype build is created. The tester then tests in that build. Sign, the ticket's signed off. That code then gets merged into our, what is our, our beta build. And the beta build is where we then cut our release from every two weeks. And that's a regular train that comes along and what's ready to go out goes out. And we have a stable build to always cut from. And in the future, we might cut twice a week. Um, it's not always going to be every two weeks. Um, but we've got to a point now, through changing some of our branching strategy, um, through having buy-in from the team about, you know, from product managers, that you know, your feature isn't that important. It can wait another two weeks. And I know, as a product manager, there is going to be another release in two weeks. Um, and it's going to be a lot more stable than it was previously. Um, and then another aspect, um, so that, that means we can release more regularly and, and, and feel safer about the release we're putting out there. Automation, once again, I'm sure lots of people in this room, you guys have, you know, you're doing this stuff, you're already aware of this, but we didn't have some of these tools in place. So there was a lot of manual work and a lot of opportunity for human kind of error. Um, you know, we, something's ready for tests, a developer had to go and get a hockey at limp and stick it into a Slack channel or stick it onto a Jira ticket. Um, we started to you know, invest in the tools such as BitRise, um, such as the Jira and Slack integration, and Fastlane so that the whole process now is a bit more, is more efficient, makes more efficient use of people's time, um, and reduces some risk of human error. And through some of these, through these three changes, there's loads of work we still need to do, but we are seeing um, our crash rate has improved. We're far more confident about the releases that we're putting out there now. Um, yeah, there's still bugs that come up, but we're going in the right direction. Um, but in terms of what were the key ingredients for us to change, like you know, like I said, I think some of this stuff is probably textbook to uh, you guys in the room. Maybe you're doing this, maybe maybe you're not. Um, but what I think is different about Depop, maybe, um, yeah, is that. We work as a team, we are a real team, we trust one another. Um, you can sometimes find yourself in environments where there is a lack of understanding and lack of open communication between people in the team across the different functions, meaning that you can kind of create some more adversarial conversations and rather than committing to doing the refactor work that you need to do so that you can then deliver more value to your users in the future, that stuff gets pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And you know what, you, you're not releasing that often. You're releasing one month, two months, and you're not getting any value out to your users. Um, and this is something that I feel at Depop, you know, we, we, we're very, very, we have a very open culture. Um, 
we share the objectives. So as in, to give you an example, I worked in a team last year that was focused very much around our, our search tab uh, and explore tab. And there was just tons of stuff to do. It was, you know, the, 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 the user experience was awful. So the way that we kind of approach this is, we're around a whiteboard. We're very lucky that we were co-located. We've got the engineers, we've got the QA, we've got people from marketing, we've got myself. We look at the data, we look at the problems in the user experience together. We look at the kind of objectives that have been drafted and people can ask questions and we can challenge each other. Is this the right thing to do? And the team buy into the solutions that we create because we're creating them together. Um, and by having this kind of open culture, I think it just makes for easier conversations when you do you know, some of that work that we looked back on previously around you know, investing in architecture, investing in automation tools. You might not, as a product manager, understand the importance of that when it's completely out of context. You guys are gonna maybe go away this evening and you've been learnt about voice search, you've learnt about uh, Rifixi, I, sorry, I can't pronounce it. But you know, if you, it depends on the culture that you're going back to and the environment you're working in, whether anyone's gonna to listen to you. Whether, where, are, do you have the open forums? Do you have the opportunity to talk with product managers and challenge each other? Um, I've been in environments where that doesn't really exist and what you happen is people just smashing their head against the wall because no one's actually on the same page and maybe the things that the tech team are saying that we should do, you know, if it was some context to it and there was some common understanding, you know, the product managers would buy into it straight away. Um, so yeah, in, in this section of the app, we delivered like tons of value to our users last year. We introduced um, working with Algolia. We introduced things like things that you know are expected this day and age. We didn't have any search suggestions. Uh, we introduced as you type search results for our for our users because a lot of people are looking for influencers on our platform who have helped promote Depot via social media. We did lots of tests, so over in the corner here, we tested showing price and size because Depop tip, tip doesn't actually have that, it's very visual. That didn't work, but you know, that, that took one developer, and, um, you know, that was a three point story, and we put it out as an A-B test, we got a learning, and then we turned it off, and we might retest that in the future. The sort functionality, once we'd integrated Algolia, that was, that was part of a developer's time in one sprint. Um, all of the backend work was already there, it was just a case of adding the button in, basically. Um, all of this stuff here, we created a new, new search uh, experience. There was just tons of stuff that we did, and, that, and we were able to deliver fast because we'd done some of the upfront work that I alluded to earlier. Um, and then ultimately, by doing that, we can get to where we wanna be. We wanna have happy users. These are some of the feedbacks I get sent directly on Facebook, because we are very, very close to our users at Depop. Um, some of that is probably not uh, safe for the workplace, but yeah. Um, and then also keeping, you know, there's investors to keep happy, there's you know, the senior leadership to keep happy, and by being able to iterate fast, because of some of that work we've done up front, means that we're able to hit our goals. Um, so, appreciate this wasn't as much of a technical uh, kind of uh, talk as maybe you usually get at these things, but basically in summary, we experienced rapid growth in our engineering team. There was a sort of degradation of our, of our app quality. Um, the things that we focused on was architecture, putting in place a common Viper structure, all new joiners are onboarded to that, developers understand how we're gonna write our code and what we're gonna do with legacy code when we're touching it. And product managers understand that as well. Um, releases, a much, much safer and regular release cadence that is putting us in a position to release whenever we want to. The tools around automation make it very, very simple for us to release now. There is no headache, it's a touch of a button. Um, and ultimately, why, you, why we were able to do these things isn't just because they exist, you know, there'll be another Viper, there'll be another Bitrise, there'll be another Fastlane, those things are gonna come and go but actually trusting one another and listening to each other because we share common objectives and because we have open forms of debate and we can be direct with one another, that I think really helps us to, to achieve our objectives. Um, so that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'm Theo, I'm a product manager. This is Nabil, who's uh, a head of our mobile team on iOS. Um, so please get in touch if you wanna learn more. And I think we're hiring, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, any questions? Uh, 
did you use analytics and uh, was it crucial to analyze uh, what user did on a particular screen and uh, uh, analyzing it did you change some stuff and uh, uh, how did it yeah. impact the results of your app yeah so we definitely use analytics um, at the moment we use Mixpanel for quite a lot of our analytics which is a quite an easy tool to plug into and product managers can use it as well as people who are you know insight specialists and everything we do is kind of data driven so looking at funnels looking at the outcomes of an of an a b test where you know you put some people in a control some people in a variant um, but it's a good point because it's an area where i think we're really strong now on the build side of things we're getting really really re really really um yeah, strong there. We can we, we're building things rapidly, and we can get things out rapidly, and they're safe releases. But the tools and the skills around uh, reporting on your A/B tests and report and understanding user behavior—that's something that I think we have opportunity to improve on. Because sometimes with mixed panels, there's certain things you can do with their reporting tools that are not you know, that they're okay, but they're not as powerful as if you were to know in uh, um, SQL, like these user, these user IDs were in the variant, these are in the control, and we can run deeper analysis using SQL queries. And I think one of the focus areas for us in the next kind of six, 12 months, probably to build our own A-B testing framework that kind of meets our needs. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, Optimize and other things, but uh, I, th I think there's an opportunity to just build it ourselves and get what we want from it, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's something we're gonna we're gonna be uh, focusing on. But yeah, analytics are key for us being data driven. Okay, cool. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, regarding the question the guy ha just asked, how many A/B tests do you have or experiments in your app? How many do we have live at this point in time? Yeah. Um, we have one. We have one on the explore page right now. We have. We've got two separate, uh, we've got two t tests in our list inflow. Um, one's a di on Android, one's on iOS, and they're different tests, so we can get different learnings and then if one, roll them out on the other platforms if they do well. We've got a couple on our explore page, so I think I showed a picture of, uh, I don't know, at the start. Yeah, this. We've got a, a different structure to this at the moment because this is curated content. We actually hand curate this. So people who look at every single thing that's coming onto the platform <laughs> and pop the things that are, are cool. But it's very hard to scale that. Uh, and also, it doesn't always match what the user wants. So we've, we've got some tests on here at the moment about breaking it up, different entry points into, into, the, uh, into the listings. So I think there's, there's a good four or five. I can't remember all the other ones. Um, yeah, but they, we've got about four or five tests live at the moment. And you, you raise a good point. At the moment, you should have oversight of all your tests because as we're scaling our tests, we need to understand the interaction of possible interaction effects. Someone needs to take responsibility for when it goes live, when it turns off, has it reached significance, doing the analysis. I sometimes, I quite often do analysis of search tests myself because I've worked at a very search heavy and test heavy company in hotels.com. I've got a bit of background in that. But we're gonna, we need to invest more in the people that actually run this because it's a full-time job, really, and coming up with hypothesis and you know, sense-checking the hypothesis, sense-checking the success metrics that you're, you're going to be looking at. Um, it takes investment. Um, someone like Hotels.com, where I work, you know, every single thing is tested, and their teams of analytics are massive. The teams of data science are massive. Um, and the tools take time to build and take investment. Any other questions? Um, you said you have uh, 50 people in your dev team. Yeah. That's right. Uh, how, um, who manage, do you have one person, two person, who manage and maintain your CI tool chain? I think in the iOS team, they don't have one person who manages it. I think they share the, the workload. But to be honest with you, that's a question I might need to revert to Nabil, who I showed on there. I don't actually know the answer to that question if it's one individual person, sorry. You don't know, okay. Yeah. Just to... um. Is there a last questions for you? 
All right. Well, thank you. Come. Cool.